Good morning, Pastor Connor here. It is 7.30 on September 25th. Thanks for joining me, being with me this morning or afternoon, evening, whenever you're joining me. So glad that you're able to be a part of this. So we've been having a conversation uh, all week on, well, really uh, how we position ourselves in God's story. So we've been talking about the scripture's view of time really as two ages right? This present age of sin, suffering, sorrow, and death, and the coming age of joy and life and celebration and so forth like that. And, and we learn that in Christ's death and resurrection and outpouring of the Spirit, he has initiated the age to come so that we experience the joys of this age already now, even though we wait for its fullness when Christ returns. So this present age, the age to come. We live in two ages simultaneously. We live in this present age of sin, suffering, sorrow, and death. And we live also in the initiation of the age to come. So this is where we find ourselves. We looked at a mu multiple texts yesterday that talked about the age to come and the fact that the age to come has come already in, a, in an initial way in Christ. So we looked at those texts like from Hebrews and Acts and Corinthians and, and Ephesians. And if you didn't watch yesterday's video, I encourage you to take the time to go back and watch it just because it will help you position yourself and understand this whole concept of the GPS system, this global positioning dot that, that God has placed in our, in our lives to show us where we live in his salvation story. All right, so take time to watch that if you didn't watch yesterday. Now today, I want to drill down on one text in particular, and I may have uh, done... We've talked about this text before. It wouldn't surprise me if I had, because it's one of my favorite ones in all of Scripture. But um, I'll simply quote my 10th grade um, um, sociology teacher, Mr. Johnson. He would say often, repetition is good for the soul. And uh, I'm not sure I appreciated it at the time, but I certainly do now. So I want to, be, want to read to you from Romans chapter 8, and this is such an important text, and I, I think it's a great corrective for much of the thinking that has kind of uh, permeated the church over the last several generations, which is the sort of uh, Christianity is basically just a die and go to heaven religion. Uh, which is so far from what the scriptures teach. Uh, Christianity is not a die and go in heaven, to, die and go to heaven religion. Although yes, as we've talked about before, uh, when the body dies, the soul is with Jesus in heaven. But Christianity is a live and see heaven come to to earth religion. Right, that the whole of creation is going to be made new, and God is going to dwell among us here. So let's get to it. I want to unpack it for two reasons, both for that, so we can understand Scripture's hope is not so much an upward hope, die and go to heaven, but a forward hope, seeing heaven come to earth and having our bodies transformed and renewed and all creation renewed. Okay, so that's part of it. But I also want us to understand again this idea of the two ages, and this will come out in Paul's words in Romans chapter 8. So Paul writes this beginning at verse number 18. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. All right, there's a lot in this little sentence. First, you notice the sufferings of this present time. Okay, hear that language? This present time. This is the time of suffering. This is the age in which we live, right? Post-fall, uh, this is the age of suffering, the fall of Adam. All right, so this is the age of suffering and loss. This is the age of pandemics and things like COVID, all right, this is the age in which we live. So this stuff, while certainly um, unpleasant for us and deeply painful for us, it should not be surprising to us because this is the age in which we live. As an example, right now in my own personal life, I live in the age of raising children, which means 
I shouldn't be surprised if the milk gets spilled 35 times in a week. I'm raising kids. What do I think is going to happen at the supper table when they're pouring their own milk? They're going to spill it. This is the age of spilled milk, right? And a whole bunch of other messes that kids make. So if you've raised kids, you can remember those days. What else would you expect? Certainly you never liked it when the milk was spilled or when dishes got broken or all this sort of thing happened. Nobody thinks those things are fun, but that's the age. That, that's, what, that's the period of life you're in. So we're in the age of sin, suffering, sorrow, and death. This is the age we're in, and Paul talks about that. But he says that this age is not worth comparing. It's not of equal value to the glory that is to be revealed to us. Now, this is a big deal. First of all, the not worth comparing. Okay, let me give you an example. <laughs> if you've ever gone to the fourth grade recorder concert, right? You all clap. Oh, yes, that was hot cross buns. Kind of. Wonderful. Oh, yep, that was Jingle Bells. Sort of. Now, that concert compared to the symphony. Get it? They're not worth comparing. Or a TV dinner compared to your favorite restaurant. All right, for us, it's Pizza Ranch. I mean, if our family goes to Pizza Ranch, this is the, the greatest thing in the world for our family. It's such a big deal. There, there's... TV dinners, that's not worth comparing to Pizza Ranch for our family. So not worth comparing, not of equal value. To what? To the glory of God. So glory of God is this huge, huge concept in Scripture. The glory of God, the best way I can put it is, this is the wow of God. All right, I don't know if I can even give us something in this life that even comes close to understanding what this wow of God is. But Notice Paul says that this glory is going to be revealed to us. So this present time, the time to come, when we have the fullness of God's glory revealed to us. This is, this is so, so exciting. It should fill our hearts with such joy because he's saying the sufferings now, they're real. They are intense. But when you compare them to the glory of God that you are going to witness, it's like the fourth grader recorder concert and the full symphony. They don't compare. All right. He goes on. And here's the part about creation being included in the restoration. This is really exciting. For the creation waits with eager longing. So on the edge of its seat for the revealing of the sons of God. Well, who are the sons of God? The sons of God are the inheritors of the kingdom of God. Now, sons of God, it's not a sexist term any more than bride of Christ is a sexist term. It's, it's a way of um, explaining our status as inheritors of the kingdom of God. Creation, all creation, is waiting to see who the inheritors of the kingdom of God are. And you say, why? Why would creation care? What's it have to do with, with redemption and salvation and so forth? Everything, all right? Because listen to what Paul says. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. Let me unpack that. Genesis chapter 3. God is speaking to Adam. These are some of the most haunting words in all of Scripture. He says, Cursed is the ground because of you, Adam. Cursed is the ground because of you, Adam. Cursed is the ground because of your sin, Adam. Creation is cursed because of you, Adam. And now by the sweat of your brow, you will have to force it to be fruitful. And you will fight weeds and thistles and all this sort of stuff that will make it difficult to bring forth food to survive. So creation has been subjected to futility, the curse of sin. And it can't wait to be released from this. And it's waiting to see who the inheritors of the kingdom of God are. Because it's those inheritors who will reign with Christ over creation. As creation is set free and brought into its full liberty and its fruitfulness and its life and its color and all that God intends for it, 
Creation is longing for this day because it is included. See, the message of Scripture is that the whole thing gets renewed. It's not a die and fly off to heaven and leave this world behind. Yes, when we die now, our souls are with Jesus in heaven. But that heaven is a place of refreshment and a place of anticipation for the resurrection of the body and the renewal of the earth. So Paul goes on like this, and he says this, For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. So groaning, red in tooth and claw, is as the poet will put it. All right, the creation is groaning, it's, it's, it's longing, but, but it's a hopeful groaning, just as in the pains of childbirth. It is a, a hopeful groaning and pain because it's looking forward to the good that is coming in, in the instance of childbirth in a child, but for creation, the, the, the birthing, if you will, of the new creation. All right? And then Paul says, and not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. All right. That's, this, is, this is amazing. The first fruits of the Spirit. Another way of putting this is the down payment, the guarantee of the renewal. So how can you know with certainty that this is going to happen? Paul says, because you have received the guarantee, the first fruits, the down payment, the Spirit of God. You have been baptized into Christ. You have received the Spirit of God. He speaks his word to you through which his Spirit comes to you. You have the gift of God's Holy Spirit. This is the down payment. This is the guarantee. This is the first fruits that you will be included in in the renewal of all creation, and you will see with your own eyes the glory of God, the wow of God. You will see it permeate all of creation and transform and liberate your body. That's a, that's a really, really big deal. So what's Paul say? Yes, we are groaning inwardly. And what are we doing? We are waiting eagerly. I mean, I don't know how else to put this, but you, know, you think of kids looking forward to their birthday or to Christmas, and they keep asking you, are we there yet? How much longer? How many more days? You know, they're just, they're impatient and they're eager and, and they're so fixated on, on this day as, it, as it's coming. And that's what Paul is saying, that sort of eager on the edge of your seat anticipation that you can't wait for it. And look what he says. Our adoption as sons, so the full revelation of our inheritance of the kingdom. And then he adds, the redemption of our bodies. See, you're not living to leave your body behind. You're living to have your body redeemed, rejuvenated, restored, released from all the things that hurt and break our bodies. You're living to have a whole body restored in the resurrection and all creation permeated with the wow of God. So again, the renewal of all creation, the resurrection of your body. And yes, that means the restoration, uh, the reunion with those we love who have died in the faith. And again, notice the two ages that Paul is, is talking about here. This present time, sin, suffering, sorrow, and death. And the age to come where the fullness of the glory of God is revealed. And Paul is saying we have the initiation of that age already and the guarantee of it in the spirit which we have received. It's a remarkable text. I commend it to you for your own personal study because I think it has the potential to really transform the way we move through this life as Christians. We're not just waiting around to die and go to heaven, right? That we are eagerly anticipating the renewal of all creation and, and we, we are already investing in this creation now because God is going to bring it to completion and he's going to renew it. Lots to think about here. As always, I welcome your questions and comments, emails, texts, messages, phone calls. Love to have the conversation with you. Hit the share button. Have other people be encouraged by this because I think so often we have such a small view of the Christian hope. And Paul is just expanding it globally. And I want you to see this is a cosmic hope. It is so joyful and so hopeful. Let's pray. Lord of mercy, God of grace, 
We are often discouraged and disheartened by the sufferings of this present time. We face difficult diagnoses. We experience acute pain and chronic pain. We grieve our dead. And now we must live with the reality of a menacing virus that is continually upending our plans, separating loved ones, and inciting fear and anxiety in our hearts and unrest in our world. Have mercy, Lord, and turn us to the promise of glory, your glory, that you will not only reveal to us, but in which you will bathe us and all creation. Give us this resurrection and this renewed creation, this age to come perspective. And receive our thanks and praise for the down payment, the guarantee, the first fruits of this glory that we have received in the giving of your spirit. So even as we groan, even as we endure the sufferings of this present time, fill us with hope in the certainty of glory of the age to come, that we as inheritors of the kingdom will experience with all creation we pray this in the name of Jesus, who lives and reigns with you and the Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Thanks so much for taking the time to be with me today. I encourage you to share, and uh, I will be back on Sunday morning for worship at 9. We'll again shoot for Bible, Bible study right around 1030, and then Pastor Johnson's back on Monday at 730, and I'll be back for morning prayer on Tuesday at 730. Thanks for being with me.